In recent months, uh, the European Union has adopted several sweeping digital regulations, including the Digital Services Act, DSA, the Digital Markets Act, DMA, and they've at the same time proposed a number of new measures, including the Data Act, the Artificial Intelligence Act, the, Medium Freedom, the Media Freedom Act, and others. These regulations will shape likely quite dramatically the environment for doing digital business in Europe and, and elsewhere. The EU has discovered the first mover advantage of regulation and I think has seen a spillover effect of their regulatory activities elsewhere in the world. Uh, what they're doing is going to have profound implications on the leading U.S. digital services providers de designated by the EU as gatekeepers, large digital service providers that are expected to adhere to regulatory requirements, as well as these companies' hundreds of millions of transatlantic European business and individual customers. Uh, CSIS uh, has analyzed the uh, impact of the EU actions, both in place, DMA and DSA, and, and coming into effect, and proposed, has analyzed the impact of those actions on uh, U.S. and EU businesses, uh, and also uh, on our, uh, over the long term, on our security, because this has uh, significant implications, we believe, for uh, Chinese companies' access to the European marketplace that will be potentially transformative uh, there as well. Uh, and to do all this, we released a report which is available online, and there's a link to it in the invitation for those of you that responded or those of you that are online now. The report is titled Implications of the EU Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act for U.S. Business. Um, I'm very pleased today to have uh, the author of that report with us to present it. Uh, and the way we're going to proceed is uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Kati in a moment, and then she's going to present the, uh, the paper. She has some slides. Uh, and then when that's concluded, we have a panel uh, that, uh, including a, a guest uh, online from, uh, from the EU, uh, who will then comment and we'll have a discussion, after which we'll have time for audience questions. Uh, if you have, if you're here in person and have a question, we'll have a microphone and you can uh, ask it. Uh, if you're online, you can submit your questions via the the link, the the button, I guess, that's on the invitation. Just click on that, write your question, and in theory, we have a technology system that will get your question to me, and then I can ask it. We will see if that works. Um, now, I'm particularly. Uh, happy to introduce the, the author of our paper, Kati Suomenen, who is, uh, among other things, an adjunct fellow here at CSIS, focusing especially on digitization, disruptive technologies, and trade. Uh, more important, she's also the founder and CEO of the Los Angeles-based Next Trade Group, which helps governments, multilateral development banks, and Fortune 500 technology companies enable trade uh, through technology. She has built dozens of data and analytical products and pilot initiatives, as well as eight global initiatives and public-private partnerships to enable digital trade, the most recent being the Alliance for E-Trade Development 1 and 2 between 14 leading companies and USAID to enable small and medium-sized enterprises uh, e-commerce in uh, developing nations. She also serves as adjunct professor at the UCLA Anderson School of Management. Uh, she's the author and editor of over 100 papers, including this one, maybe that makes it, makes it 101, um, and 10 peer-reviewed books with leading academic presses. The most recent one is called Revolutionizing World Trade, How Disruptive Technologies Open Opportunities for All, uh, and that was published by the Stanford University Press, uh, and those of you that haven't read it, you should, and I'm sure you can figure out how to get it with what I just said. So with that, I'll turn the podium over to Kati to make the presentation, and then we'll have our panel discussion. Kati? Thanks very much. Thank you all for joining. Thank you to those that are joining remotely. Um, as uh, Bill mentioned, um, the EU has issued rather sweeping digital regulations over the past number of years. And, um, of course, there's been also very robust enforcement actions, uh, particularly against U.S. companies from uh, the, the Europeans. And today we wanted to focus particularly on the acts that are coming now online this year and next year, the Digital Markets Act, the Digital Services Act, and a number of other uh, policies and regulations that the EU is 
is pursuing and explore a little bit their implications on U.S. Uh, digital service providers that are likely targets of these uh, enforcement actions um, and, um, and also discuss um, the um, uh, potential implications on EU, EU's own companies that are using U.S. digital services. So here we go. Um, I will skip over that. So we, we are looking at the um, Digital Markets Act and Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, of course, is targeting kind of gatekeeper companies to be defined, which those exactly are. And these companies are to then enable um, service providers, those designated companies enable other service providers to interoperate uh, with their services. They are to enable greater access to um, third parties to use their platforms uh, and are prevented from kind of cross-referencing data from their various platforms and also are, are prevented from kind of self-preferencing, providing their own services on, on, and products on their platforms. There's also the Digital uh, Services Act, which is perhaps more sweeping, uh, covers more companies, and that is, uh, has special regulations for the very large uh, online platforms, the VLOPs, uh, so to speak. And uh, this uh, act focuses much more on the online content and its governance. So there you have the snapshot uh, there on screen. Uh, there is, of course, much more complexity under the hood um, on, these, on these acts and regulations. So we wanted to get a sense of what the implications of these acts are, who they might be um, targeted. Um, Bill mentioned already there's other acts as well, the Data Act, the AI Act, um, that the EU is also pursuing. Uh, so we're, we also covered these a little bit in the paper, but the mostly focused on the DMA and DSA. So if we think of the DMA uh, regulations, it's really focused on the largest uh, uh, digital service providers that have at least, um, my understanding is uh, 6.5 billion in annual revenue um, in, um, in, um, in, in the uh, EU, and that have an average market uh, cap of $75 billion, and then have activities across uh, the EU and have 45 million users. Um, the, the, when we run the numbers and we look at who might be uh, falling under that definition, uh, we kind of unequivocally find that it's the largest five U.S. Uh, technology companies that have the uh, user numbers, that have the revenues, that have the market capitalization that uh, is defined in the, in the DMA. Um, it is questionable whether the Chinese companies uh, might fall under this regulation. Actually, their numbers are quite untransparent, uh, particularly EU revenue and user base. And then, you know, there are some questions whether some EU companies like Spotify might also fall under the regulation. But it's pretty clear based on the numbers that it would be the top five U.S. digital service providers that might be subject to this act. Now, if we think of kind of the first order effects of, okay, if you're subject to this act, what do you have to do? And what's already taking place is companies are, of course, seeking to come to compliance with these um, acts. And if we assume that, say, 1% of these companies, of the top five U.S. companies' revenues is invested in compliance, the, um, you know, there's, a, there's about, about um, uh, uh, 13 billion uh, cost upfront already just coming in, in line with these regulations. Of course, if they invest 2% of their global revenue, that doubles. And then furthermore, if these companies invest um, you know, in the compliance and are fined, if there's even a 10% chance of being fined both under the DSA and, and DMA, the cost could be as high as $50 billion uh, for U.S. companies. And, and it's, um, you know, could be quite, quite possible to be, to, to be fined under these regulations, given that they are rather vaguely defined and given the robust enforcement action that uh, EU has pursued in the past as well. So the cost can, be rise, can rise quite significantly, uh, quite quickly as well, kind of the first order effects for American digital service providers. Um, the um, uh, in kind of job terms, what this might mean is up to 70,000 uh, uh, jobs in these companies. And of course, the worst case scenario, if all U.S. companies were fined and they invested in compliance, but they were all still fined under both acts, the, the, the absolute worst case nightmare scenario would be something like $250 billion uh, expenditure. And then, of course, this calculation is just, you know, upfront numbers 
um, this doesn't take into effect, uh, or t take into account the kind of lost network effects of, um, of, of um, uh, US companies, the ability to offer the bundled services, the ability to use uh, data across different platforms, different services, to, uh, to offer new, new services or, or to offer their own services, kind of self-preference, uh, which is really are the, the core issues for US companies and, and the core uh, competitive drivers, if you want, of, for US technology companies that they have built over, over years and that the, these acts, particularly DMA, would prevent them from, from uh, leveraging. And then, you know, of course, one can think of that if the US companies that are providing digital services had um, uh, certain costs coming from uh, compliance, coming from enforcement of, uh, of these acts, uh, they might be, you know, somebody has to pay. They may, may pass some of the cost on to their business users or their uh, individual users in Europe. And uh, those are kind of the second order effects that um, I don't think have been analyzed sufficiently um, and that we sought to get our arms around a little bit. So what, what is uh, clear from a survey that we ran as part of this study with 500 uh, European companies is that EU companies really, you know, use U.S. technologies very widely. So we think of different U.S. services, like uh, uh, you, can, you can think of uh, AWS services, you can think of uh, Google Cloud, you can think of number of services that Microsoft provides. Um, EU companies tend to use, many of them, the larger companies use five or more of these American services. The smaller companies, maybe three or more. Um, of, of U.S. Uh, services, and they tend to like them. They, they tend to say that they get good value for money, the services are good, they have opted to use this. So U.S. technologies, U.S. digital services are very ubiquitous um, in Europe. Uh, I think all of us instinctively know that. And uh, we also know that European companies then spend on U.S. digital services and, and overall in, in various technologies, um, and up to you know, 5 to 10 percent of their revenue goes into technology uh, expenditures. So if we were to assume that um, just, you know, the overall IT spending from resulting um, from these acts went up by 5% in Europe, we see that there might be implications of up to 71 billion uh, euro for European companies uh, if, if, if all of their IT expenditures went up by this amount, uh, 5%, and uh, as a result of of these acts. These numbers can, of course, be contested. We have a number of assumptions behind them. But nonetheless, they, you know, one might assume that there are certain costs. And in fact, if we are asking EU companies, well, what would a 5% increase in your technology cost um, imply? EU companies, 65% of them said in the survey that it would be actually worse than the inflationary pressures that they're feeling or the or their, um, uh, supply chain backlogs that have been uh, challenging for, for EU companies, US companies as well. Now, these impacts can, of course, vary by EU companies. If they incur a technology cost increase, they may switch providers, they may pass the cost on to their own customers, they may simply do something else, uh, hire fewer people, what have you. And here you can see the heterogeneous <laughs> impacts, if you want, of, on, on, on um, EU companies. They, they might opt to do a number of things in reaction to a cost increase. So. Um, overall, you know, if, we, if we're thinking of the kind of third order effects even, um, there may be then, you know, loss of uh, competitiveness in export markets, there may be lower labor productivity for EU companies, and there may be, of, of course, a higher cost for those companies that came online and started to operate during COVID um, in, in, um, in the, uh, oftentimes in the digital economy, quite technology intensive kind of te European startups. So, number of implications that have yet to be seen, but we should uh, probably pay attention to. Now, if there is an increase on U.S. technology companies and digital service providers spending um, uh, on, on enforcement or on, on compliance with EU's regulations, that might also have repercussions on U.S. companies, right, that are clients to, uh, to these large technology companies. And uh, we calculated using kind of similar estimates of 5% uh, technology cost increase that U.S. companies would incur a cost of $97 billion from, from uh, these kinds of increases, of which about uh, $45 billion would be carried by SMEs. Again, depends on what assumptions one uses, but you know, there, there could be 
some implications from technology cost uh, uh, increases also for US, US companies. So, um, and the final thing I wanted to highlight on these kind of implications is the fact that EU uh, is a big user of US digital services and that those are US uh, digital service exports to, to Europe. Uh, US uh, exports digital service at, at the order of 600 billion a year. Um, about 33% of that, 170 billion roughly, is to the EU. And so if US lost 10% uh, of market share uh, in the EU just as a result of these acts, the implications would be 2% uh, less of US uh, services exports and 1% cut in US overall exports. So the numbers, given the size of the and dynamism of the EU market um, for, for US companies, are, are pretty sizable, pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, potential uh, impacts um, on, on U.S. exports, on U.S. Uh, uh, company sales to European companies and, and furthermore to then European companies' own costs. Um, the further implications could be on uh, the Chinese companies that are in Europe and may be unhampered by these acts. As, as, you, can, as you saw, you know, Chinese companies are, are unlikely to fall uh, under, these, under the DMA and um, you know, they could actually uh, benefit uh, from these acts if U.S. companies and their fiercest competitors are, are being um, uh, undermined by these acts. So, you know, it is quite possible that uh, Europe might see a scenario where companies are using less U.S. Uh, providers and increasing their use of Chinese providers, and this might have a number of implications to, you know, cybersecurity implications and so forth. So it's another important implication that it's not a very good deal for either Europe or the United States, uh, in my view. The, so, yeah, as a, as a summary, just, uh, you know, we're looking at probably immediate uh, impacts on U.S. companies from compliance with these acts, up to, you know, $50 billion if there's also some fines um, on these companies, and then potential increases for, for U.S. Uh, uh, small businesses as well as for European companies that are using U.S. digital services and potential geostrategic implications for, for, uh, for our, our uh, economies uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. So I think the panel will discuss much more what the recommendations might be, what should we do um, to, to, to think about these acts and, and going forward as well. And you know, I guess my suggestion would be to use the existing mechanisms that we have, the uh, US-EU uh, Trade and Technology Council in particular, to address this perhaps you know, in a very candid way, measure the impacts, uh, whether, these, whether these impacts actually will, will uh, bear out as these acts uh, go into effect. And then you know, together think about also the implications, these geostrategic implications. And I think we'll also discuss in the panel of what we could do in the United States to better perhaps coordinate um, actions um, and, and discussion on on these uh, acts. So, Bill, I think I'll I'll stop there. But uh, look forward to the panel. Thanks very much. Well, if the panel will come up and join us. We'll get started on that part, and let's tune in, uh, Gerard, if we can as well. Let me introduce the, uh, the panel, and then we'll get right into the, the, um, the issues that, that uh, Kadi raised. Uh, to my immediate left is Meredith Broadbent, who is uh, a senior advisor, non-resident, uh, here at, at CSIS. She's a former chair of the U.S. International Trade Commission, a former assistant U.S. trade representative for industry, market access, and telecommunications in the, the aughts. I guess that's what we're calling that decade. Uh, and in that position, she was responsible for developing U.S. policy that affected trade in industrial goods, telecommunications, and e-commerce. She led the U.S. negotiating team for the Doha Round negotiations to reduce tariff and non-tariff barriers on industrial goods. Uh, previously, she served as a senior professional staff member with the Committee on Ways and Means uh, in the House. I think we've got three former Hill staffers here. Um, wonderful place for, for employment, uh, wonderful place to be an alumnus from. Uh, 
and so we're delighted to have her here with us. The, uh, this paper, I didn't mention this in the opening comments, but this particular paper is one in a long series we have done on EU digital trade regulation dating back to 2020. Um, and uh, Connie was involved in an earlier one of those too, but uh, this, uh, her paper is actually, I think, number 10 uh, in the series, some short, some long. Uh, and Meredith, uh, following uh, this paper, Meredith is producing three additional ones, which are short uh, and more editorial than, than uh, analytical in content. One of those is already out, and the next two will be out in the next, uh, in the next uh, month or two. Uh, so in addition, here uh, alive, we have uh, Rob Strayer, who is the Executive Vice President for Global Policy at the Information Technology Industry Council, ITI where he leads the technology sector's efforts to shape pro-innovation policy in major global markets on a wide range of issues, including cybersecurity, privacy, data flows, and AI. Uh, before that, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Cyber and International Communications Policy uh, at the State Department. And in that role, he led dozens of dialogues with foreign governments on technology regulation and cybersecurity policy issues. Uh, he was also uh, our ambassador to uh, the uh, International, Telecommun Tele International Telecommunications Union Plenipotentiary Conference in uh, 2018, leading the U.S. Uh, negotiating team. Before the State Department, as I alluded to, he was the general counsel for the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Then on screen, I'm delighted, here he is on screen, is uh, Gerard de Graff, who is the senior U.S. EU envoy for uh, digital and head of the new EU office in San Francisco. A wise move by the EU, I think, in stationing somebody out in the midst of a lot of uh, high-tech activity. He has worked for more than 30 years uh, on the European Commission across a wide range of policy areas. Uh, before his current position, he was a director within DG Connect, which is the Director General for Communications Networks, Content and Technology. Uh, and there he was responsible for the Digital Services and Digital Markets Act, uh, which are very much under discussion. He has also been co-chairing two of the EU-US Trade and Technology Council working groups, uh, the one on green technology and the other on data governance and technology platforms. And I think one of the topics we'll get to today, no doubt, is the role of the TTC in uh, addressing these issues. So that's the panel, and I think uh, we'll begin by giving Gerard the next first shot at this and ask him in particular, um, he's welcome, uh, you're welcome to comment on the paper, but the particular question is, uh, did the EU do uh, a, an impact analysis like this uh, before or during their development of these laws, and if so, what did they conclude? Well, good morning, Bill, and um, good morning, uh, panelists uh, and, and audience. Uh, it's really a, an early morning here from San Francisco. It's still dark uh, outside. Uh, I'm pleased to, to be here. Uh, I wanted to actually take a step back before answering your question. And the answer to your question is, was there an impact analysis? And of course, there was an impact analysis because that's a mandatory requirement under uh, the better regulation standards that we apply in the in the European Union, and I'll, I'll I'll come to that. But I I wanted to take a step back and ask ourselves the question: Why is the EU doing this? Um, what's behind? I mean, is the EU doing this to impose huge administrative burdens on American companies? Of course not. Not the reason why we're doing it, and 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 we also dispute, and and, and that's probably another point that I mean, it's certainly another point that will come to the findings of the study, which uh, we, 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 we have very, very strong reservations about. I, I think, first of all, maybe on the Digital Markets Act, just to note that there's very broad agreement around the world that digital markets aren't working well. Uh, the, the biggest platforms have disproportionate power, and, 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 and this leads to kind of behaviors that impact very negatively innovation and, and opportunities for, for smaller players. And I mean, in the US, in Washington, DC, there are over 20 platform bills, or there were over 20 platform bills in the last Congress. Um, the White House published um, tech accountability principles in September 2022, mirroring very, very closely the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Uh, earlier this week, President Biden in the State of the Union 
uh, called for bipartisan regulation of, of big tech. And I mean, we've also kind of, of course, have a, a whole range of EU competition cases that have really demonstrated there's a problem in this in this market. And, and also last week, for example, the NTIA published a study that the, um, the mobile app market isn't working uh, and, and is creating serious uh, harms uh, for, for app developers and for, for, for users uh, in, in general. So that, that's the fact. Those are the facts. Uh, and then if you look at like what's happening around the world, and it's not just the EU, I mentioned the US, but Japan, the UK, Australia, Canada, there's a lot of kind of reflections on, on, on regulatory, um, uh, a need for regulatory uh, measures. I mean, there's in, in the US House, there's also a very interesting uh, in the last Congress, the House of Representatives Majority Staff report about the problems of, of competition in digital markets. I mean, uh, so so we are not alone. Uh, the European Union isn't like the only jurisdiction in the world that's saying there's a problem there where, where kind of uh, not enough competition, gatekeepers staying out of each other's market and, and basically imposing costs on other companies uh, by denying them opportunities and, 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 and growth. Well, that's the Digital Markets Act. The Digital Services Act, uh, how to keep the internet safe or make the internet safe. I, I think we all know there's a problem. Also, uh, very, very intensive discussions in the US about content moderation around the world. Uh, I mean, we are, folk, I mean, we are we're, we're kind of confronted with threats to our democracy, um, with disinformation, illegal content, etc. So before then, that's why I wanted to set this out first. In this, these are not trivial issues. Uh, these are issues which are kind of, there is a, a very strong consensus around the world that there are problems that need to be tackled and they need to be tackled through regulation. Um, and, and, and what is a bit surprising about the study, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that, is that there's absolutely no intention or there's not even an attempt to look at the benefits of regulation because the regulation is about kind of creating a, a single market about making the internet safer about stimulating innovation and competition there's going to be huge benefits coming out of out of that some very measurable other things may be a little less measurable and and, and it's therefore surprising i think anytime you do an analysis of the impacts of regulation, you, you, you just don't just you, you look at cost, you look also at benefits, you do a cost benefit analysis. This, this doesn't seem to, this report doesn't seem to be interested in the benefits at all of, of regulation. Now, impact assessment, has the EU done an impact assessment? Of course we've done an impact assessment, a very extensive impact assessment which actually goes through but we have a, a regulatory and independent regulatory scrutiny board that looks at it and comments on it very critical. The impact assessment is made public. The um, assessment of the regulatory scrutiny board is made public. What are the kind of the strengths? Where, where could the report be, be, be strengthened? Uh, and, and, and so, I mean, that's what has been done. It's, uh, it's, it's informed by a lot of studies that we have also undertaken over many years, uh, because this, this type of legislation, of course, is prepared, doesn't just come out of, the, out of the blue. The conclusions of this is that, yes, there are costs, like all, all uh, legislation raises uh, some, some costs, but the benefits far outweigh the costs, and the costs are absolutely kind of... Um, much, much lower than the estimates that, that uh, are in the report of, uh, of Dr. Shominen. So, so that's kind of, I think, where we are on the, on, on, on the issue. These issues also, I mean, there was discussion about, well, um, the, the, has this been discussed in, in the TTC? I mean, we've had intensive discussions during the negotiations with the US, the White House in particular. These issues are, were never kind of uh, I mean, uh, raised because they are. I mean, the report is 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 is, is not a uh, a fair uh, reflection of the the reality. Uh, it's based on unclear assumptions. We don't know what's in scope. We don't know where the data comes from. We have a very strong impression that the authors of the study don't really uh, understand the DSA and the DMA very well. There's been. Um, kind of assumptions made about how it will be implemented, I mean, uh, potential sanctions that will be 
um, uh, enforced. Uh, I mean, the impact on, on on Chinese companies. I mean, I can I can go on and on and on and speak the whole the whole time of this. I mean, this this is a study that we will not take seriously uh, because it's uh, it's a study that is based on on assumptions that methodology that we, we believe is uh, is erroneous. Kari, do you want to defend your assumptions? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just the premise of starting this report that we, we wanted to start to highlight the potential costs that there are. And, you know, as you mentioned, there are regulatory regulations have costs. I mean, we've seen it uh, in a number of policy domains. And certainly, you know, here is a rather sweeping regulations. We don't know also what the actual implications might be given the the breadth of potential enforcement action. So, you know, I think it's it's a helpful and, and healthy uh, discussion to start. Hopefully this is just the beginning of the discussion, what the implications could be, and then for us to measure uh, over time also to understand better the implications. So I, I don't say this is the last word, right? But, uh, but I think, uh, you know, if we, we start to understand that there, somebody needs to, of course, incur a cost from, from regulations, as you mentioned. I think this is uh, useful useful discussion to, to start. One can always, you know, uh, to change the assumptions of a model and, and so forth, but, uh, but uh, you know, I think this is a very good, uh, good starting point, and I'm glad that we have this uh, debate. Well, Rob or Meredith, uh, do you think the costs exceed the benefits, or vice versa? Uh, if, if I may, I, I mean, I'd answer that question so directly, but let me just talk to some high-level principles here that I think inform this discussion. You know, if you think about, you know, in the context of regulation, what does it take for technology companies to be successful? What they need is a vision for a product or service that is years out, that's going to require massive research and development costs. So they need the access to capital, a lot of time. They also need a relatively stable regulatory environment. They need to have certainty about the uses of data and the re business regulation that's going to follow in those years while they're doing that R&D. And lastly, they need to recover that capital through scale in what many companies call a total addressable market. So they need to have that scale at the back end to both recover that cost and also to improve the next generation of that technology and service. Now in the United States, the great success of Silicon Valley has been that we've taken a very uh, restrictive approach to regulation over the years, closely identifying uh, any gaps and then only then acting in the form of regulating and usually narrowly tailoring that regulation to those gaps. Uh, the European Union has a different system, a different legal system, and we will have different systems. Uh, but I think it's important for the American audience to understand that the way that uh, the European Union usually works is there are directives set out. Those directives uh, usually take years to implement uh, through oftentimes member state activities as well as uh, decisions by commissions and courts. So we saw GDPR play out over a course of a number of years, uh, including having the Schrems decision in 2020 undoing many years of work that have followed before that. Uh, Kadi already enumerated a number of, uh, of major directives that are coming out during this commission since 2020. Uh, I would count at least eight of them that have either been completed or will be completed. So I think at the end of this, there needs to be an assessment of where would companies choose to invest in the future? Has the level of regulation reached a level where companies would choose not to invest in Europe because of the level of regulation? Uh, and also as a sub-study of that, I think one needs to consider, especially for the smallest companies, are there now so many regulations they cannot reach the top tier of, uh, of expansion because there's a, a number of regulations that are sitting on top of them? Uh, I also mentioned scale just a minute ago. Scale is really important. Between the United States and Europe, uh, collectively, those economies represent almost 50% of global GDP. Uh, Kadi also mentioned that you know, these regulations, as currently structured, only apply to U.S. companies, at least at the highest level of impact. It does not apply to Chinese companies. The, if you look, and since we're here at CSIS, we should talk about the global competition issue. If you look at what Western companies, Western tech will face, they need a global market to address between the U.S. and EU combined. The Chinese have a protected market in many ways from a trade perspective, so they don't face a lot of global competition in their domestic market, and then they also have access to foreign markets. So the level of regulation is really important to consider in how it will impact future global technology competition and success for Western companies. Uh, 
And if I just want to mention one other thing is that on the DMA and DSA in particular, uh, I mentioned that the, the regulations can be uh, expanded upon for years. These are good examples of that, actually. There are some very broad obligations. First of all, definitions of, for example, in the DMA of what is a gatekeeper, and broad obligations to interconnect with other messaging services or share your data with others. And those interconnections with data services, uh, messaging services, or provision of data could go to companies that are closely aligned with the Chinese Communist Party. So to get the security right really requires intensive scrutiny and a lot of work to get there. Uh, the DMA will be enforced as of May 2023, just a few months from now. Now, the Commission has offered up three workshops to get at those very difficult issues. What really needs to be done is a much more intensive regulatory dialogue between all of the stakeholders, that would include the gatekeepers, as well as others that have not been deemed gatekeepers, to really figure out these very difficult security issues to make sure that the DMA can be what the uh, policymakers envision it should be. So thanks again for including me. Um, actually, actually, that relates to a question we're getting, we've already gotten from the audience. But Meredith, do you want to make a comment first and then we'll... Uh, yeah, no, I, we're so grateful to have Mr. DeGraff here with us. And I guess my sense would be if we're going to try to look at transatlantic collaboration in the TTC, uh, what is the role of the TTC in kind of getting the regulation right so it does meet the objectives that, that Europe is seeking and vice versa, whatever concerns you have about the U.S., but how far, you mentioned that you were having intensive discussions on the DSA and the DS, DMA, I think I heard you say, although you can describe that, but it'd be interesting to know because I think we've got the DSA and the D, DMA are going to be implemented. They're all, way along the line and there's four or five other initiatives in the pipeline that are heading towards U.S. businesses. And if we could get a, a better back and forth and exchange of some of our perceptions of what the practical effects and the certainty around the legislation, I think it would be helpful. So if you could just speak a bit to the TTC process, that would be helpful. I would be glad to do that if, if, if you are, are okay with that, Bill. I mean, I, I just need to correct a few statements that were made because I think it's always important we talk on the basis of a common understanding and the common understanding is I mean and, and the basis of what's in the law and not what people think might be in the law that's not in the law I, I think first of all this is law uh, so this is this is going to be implemented um, and so we are always discussing and we've been discussing for several years with the US on, on, and other countries because there's a lot of interest of course not just in the US in, in these laws uh, but this is the law, so we're not, uh, I mean, we're not in a situation here where the European Union, as far as the DSA and the EMA is concerned, is going to reopen the, the legislation that has been democratically decided in the, uh, in the European Union by the, the co-legislative branches. It's also regulation. Um, I, I, I think the, kind of, I mean, the idea that somehow now it will take years and years and member states will, will implement it very differently, no. The regulation the European Union may means it's just one set of rules that have, have direct effect. They have to be implemented as it's written. The text is also pretty clear. Uh, so the idea that this is some kind of vague text and people don't know what to do, well, that's not correct. Uh, the issue about China, which is, of course, a highly emotional and sensitive issue. I mean, th th there's assumptions made here that Chinese companies will not be in scope. Well, I, I, I dispute these assumptions. Um, so the idea that somehow this will target exclusively U.S. companies is, is a false assumption. Um, and, and, and there were issues or, or, or questions raised about like interoperability and interconnection of messenger services and somehow the Chinese could come in and connect with messenger services in the European Union. Well, of course not. I mean, the Europeans aren't stupid. Uh, that, uh, that's uh, somehow through legislation kind of it allows uh, massive cyber espionage and, and, and it exposes the, the European Union citizens and, and, and industry to, to, to massive risks. So those, those kind of kind of nightmare or, or, or kind of massive fear scenarios are the, the absolute, there's no, no truth in them at all. Just let's discard them. Let's not waste our time on these, these issues because they're not, they're not true. I think what is important is that we're tackling here unfair practices uh, in the DMA in particular. Uh, 
you know, I think to, uh, Dr. Swamin gave a number of examples like self-preferencing. Well, we don't like self-preferencing in the European Union. We don't think you should gain success in a marketplace by giving yourself undue advantages. Other examples is you shouldn't be kind of locking in your, your customers. You shouldn't be kind of imposing certain rule, rules on app developers that make it very difficult for them to, to innovate. So this is more about don'ts. Uh, companies shouldn't be doing a number of things because we think that's not how a market should operate. This is not how you should gain success in a market. And, and as I said before, a lot of countries around the world agree with that, that the EU is capable of legislating on it, and maybe the US not, not has, has to do, of course, with reasons which we also understand. It's just very difficult in the political situation and in the Congress to, to get these type of measures through. But, but that, this does, that this means that somehow the, the problems aren't recognized or identified. I, I think that's, that's not, not a, a, a correct perspective on the, on the issues. So we have been discussing this intensively with the White House, with the U.S., even during the negotiations. These issues, I mean, if, if this was kind of the perception and the reality, do you think these, the, 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 this would not have been brought up during the, legis during the negotiation of the legislation? Of course, if the kind of figures that are in the report were even remotely true. I mean, these issues would have been brought up by the U.S. administration very, very intensively, and they were not because the U.S. administration largely agrees that what the European Union is doing with the DSA and the DMA is a measured and a balanced way of addressing problems that also, I think, are widely shared by the U.S. administration and, and, and large parts also in the, in, in the Congress. So, of course, we continue to discuss with the TT, in, within the TTC. We have to see how this all imp is implemented and, and, and pans out. But somehow now kind of pulling an alarm bell where, frankly, there's, there's this, the, the kind of issues that or, or, or the, the nightmare scenarios are, I mean, this, uh, not at all kind of uh, within the realm of reality. Uh, let's not kind of create a panic where there's absolutely no reason to panic. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's hard these days. And let's work on the basis of a thorough understanding of what this is all about. So let's also not spread misinformation or disinformation about the DSA and the DMA, because then, then there's not, that's not a fruitful discussion if we kind of start interpreting the legislation in ways that, kind of, frankly, it's, it's not been written. Let me go back at a couple of things you said. First of all, I'd say my impression of uh, the Biden administration's view of the DMA and DSA is very, very different from yours, uh, but we'll have to let them speak for themselves. I'm not going to speak for them. But well, we're talking to the administration, uh, Bill. I mean, I can only say what we've been discussing in the TTC where I was present. So maybe your perception is different. I hear what I hear yeah. in the discussions uh, yeah. in the TTC. Well, we should have another event with the administration, let them speak for themselves. It's hard here to have, uh, in the United States, uh, unfortunately, to have a trade discussion without talking about China. And it's come up here a couple times. Are you saying that uh, there are going to be Chinese companies that will be uh, classified as gatekeepers? Well, I'm not going to anticipate the designation, but it is quite likely that there will be Chinese companies designated as gatekeepers, yes. And there will be European companies designated as gatekeepers as well. If you look at the DSA, I mean, there's, of course, I mean, this is asymmetric legislation. Huh? So the gatekeeper, kind of the DMA, there are going to be 10, 15 not companies, but activities by companies in scope, because we don't cover companies, we cover what we call services of companies. So companies may be in scope, but not for all of their activities. Amazon will probably be in scope for the marketplace activities, but not for Amazon Prime or other activities that are not uh, part of the kind of the, 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 the scope of the, the Digital Markets Act. If you look at the DSA, I mean, a lot of the smaller companies are exempted from the DSA, and then we have a layered approach. So the bigger you are, more obligations you, you have to, to, to comply with. And, and there are companies, all companies operating in Europe, wherever they are from, China, Japan, etc., will be in scope. So all the activities that companies undertake when they target the European market will be in scope. But for the DMA, 
Yes, of course. The internet structure is what it is. I mean, it's, it, the U.S. companies have been tremendously successful in the European Union that providing great services as well in the European Union, but there are certain behaviors which we do not welcome in the European Union. And, and, and so the structure is what it is. Yes, the, the, there will be uh, effects on, on U.S. companies, but there will be effects on European companies and there will be effects on Chinese companies as well. And there are going to be a lot of companies, including other gatekeepers, because the interesting dynamic now is, of course, we discuss a lot with gatekeepers because we're in pre-designation dis uh, discussions. And yes, they may not like always uh, the, the new situation that they will have to operate in in the European Union, but they're very keen on ensuring that the obligations that apply to their competitors, other gatekeepers are effectively enforced. Uh, so it's not also black and white where all the gatekeepers are looking, oh, we don't like it. They may, they may not like it what applies to them, but they like very much what applies to their competitors in the European Union. Rob, well, can I just respond? Please. I, I, I think uh, one other issue here as the regulations are implemented is that to ensure fundamental fairness in a regulatory process, it's really important that the policymakers have one of their own companies or regulated subjects subject to those same regulations. Therefore, when that company is treated that way, that is the, pl the core political constituency of a government, is someone in their own jurisdiction. So when you're just applying it to people outside, there's a substantially greater risk that it's applied in an unfair manner. And I just want to re refer back to one point about the DMA. I mean, there is definitely interpretation that's going to happen here. Uh, can I just point out on the point about security? I mean, it says a gatekeeper can only take uh, steps on security to the extent that they are strictly necessary and proportionate. Not just necessary, strictly necessary. That is subject to massive interpretation. Proportionality is fundamentally a subjective assessment. So I think there really does have to be some real deep dive here, intensive scrutiny about what kind of measures are going to have to be applied by companies that will cost them millions or even billions of dollars. Yeah, I, I was just uh, interested in the workshop process that you have. We, we hear a lot from companies that are, are trying to figure out how to get their systems up to be in compliance. And some of the, they're feeling there's a lot of uncertainty there and just wondered how, as you go through the implementation process, you'll be consulting with companies and letting them know what they actually need to do. Well, we've been, I mean, there's workshop, but we've been in discussions with these companies since June, July, May, June, July of last year, when these measures were uh, formally adopted by the Council and the Parliament. It then took a couple of months before they were kind of on the statute book. So we've been having ongoing discussions with all potential, at least those who believe that they will be gatekeepers under the definition of the, the Digital Markets Act, or they will be very large online platforms under the definition of the Digital Services Act. So we've been discussing in great, great detail because, of course, as you yourself point out, I mean, it's important that these companies know what they have to do. Uh, also, because in many cases, this will require quite some, say, technical re-engineering of, 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 I mean, if, if you look at the App Store, for example, in, in Europe, we will require side loading. Uh, so it should be possible if you have, a, like an iPhone, you, you should be able to download apps from other app stores. Well, this requires quite some significant software re-engineering of an app store. You effectively have to rebuild or, or maybe build a new app store, and you need time for that. This is not something that you can do like a week or two weeks before the entry into application, which is not next May, but is likely to be like in March of, of 2023. The Digital Services Act for the very large online platform will most likely kick in on the 1st of September of this year, so in about 200 days. Um, so these discussions are continuous. We will do workshops really more technical on issues around interoperability of messenger services, for example, which is complicated and, and it's not simple that there's a requirement to have to open up your, your messenger service. There's a lot of kind of conditions that will have to be fulfilled. There must also be demand. Uh, there must be a, a kind of a, a messenger service who will want to interconnect with another messenger services. So it's not like auto automatic. And, and these issues will need to be sorted out. And during the implementation, of the Digital Markets Act, there's a regulatory dialogue. So it's the kind of the company comes and say, look, this is the way we think we should, we will implement it. This is the way we've taken care of security and privacy, which the European Union cares about a lot. I mean, it's not for nothing that we have 
a GDPR in the European Union. It's not for nothing that we have cyber, extensive cyber regulation in the European Union, because we deeply care about these issues, like the US does. So the European Union is not going to take any risks with the cybersecurity and the privacy for its companies and, 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 and for its own citizens. So these are the kind of issues that will, will be discussed. And I'm, I'm quite confident that in these discussions, solutions will be found. And the legislation is pretty clear. This is not like a vague framework. We do's and don'ts. And the do's and don'ts are quite clear how, how they kind of should, to what, what outcomes they should deliver. But this is a constant discussion with these companies. And, and we've had, as I said, before a number of times already, we've had intensive discussions also with the U.S. administration, with the White House, actually, as we speak today and yesterday, colleagues from the White House are in Brussels to discuss the DSA and the DMA. So we have constant discussions on these, but not about these issues that we're discussing this morning about excessive disproportionate costs. How can we do this in a sensible way? Because we don't have an interest in the European Union to end up with unnecessary costs in terms of implementation. But again, let's look at the benefits. Let's not forget we're trying to address here problems that are globally recognized, that are costing our economies and, and, and consumer welfare enormous amounts of money over many years already. Practices that are unfair. We don't want unfairness. We want people to compete. We want companies to compete like you do in the US. I mean, you want companies to, to, to show that they're better. They have a better mousetrap than other companies. You don't want companies to compete unfairly. Well, neither do the Europeans. And that's why we are regulating in the DMA. We want the internet to be safe. Americans want that too. That's why we are regulating. We don't want massive illegal content, child sex abuse material, spread of disinformation, dangerous products that might harm people circulating on the internet. US wants this too. Europe is going to regulate this. Yeah, there are going to be a few administrative costs. Some things are no longer possible in the European Union. Are we going to be better off at the end of it? Yes, we're going to be better off at the end of it. Are we going to stand up for our democracy? Yes, we're going to stand up for our democracy. And our democracy is priceless. I've actually got a good number of questions here from the audience, so I want to turn to those in a minute. Do either of you want to comment on uh, I uh, one, Meredith? One question for Kati on the transparency of the Chinese investment in Europe and whether they meet some of those thresholds. Is it harder? to see how they compare with U.S. companies in terms of size and turnover and whether they meet the thresholds to be restricted? Yeah, at least we had challenges getting the data on, on Chinese companies, particularly on their EU revenue and the number of users. So perhaps the, the commission of the EU has a better, better sense of this, but uh, at least for, from the outside, it seemed uh, more challenging in, in U.S. companies. Uh, following that, another question for Kadi. Um, on the cost increase, on the cost issue. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, questioner suggests that probably something similar happened uh, uh, on the implementation of GDPR. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any data on that? Or Rob, do you have any data on that? <laughs> I, I don't have data. No. Yeah, and this might actually be a good one. Um, I think those estimates, there have been a number of estimates coming from European think tanks as well on GDPR. But I think this is exactly what we should do now with, uh, with DMA, DSA, other uh, acts, is to keep measuring the impacts and, and having this constant dialogue with U.S. companies, with you know, whoever is designated as a, as a gatekeeper, um, as well as European companies that are the users of these digital services. I think this, this, we, we need to have a dialogue on this, what the real implications are and what the cost may be for, for European companies. So, I, you know, I think this is just the beginning, us kind of simulating potential effects, but then ex exposed, we have to keep, keep doing this uh, year after year. So related to that is a number of people have pointed out that <clears throat> there are other countries, including Japan and others, that are contemplating similar actions, mm -hmm. uh, not identical with DMA and DSA, but along the same lines. Actually, the United States is debating the same thing, as, as uh, Gerard pointed out. Um, are, has there been any analysis of the potential uh, global costs of this, or what uh, the costs of what other countries are doing, or is it not far enough along to do that? Yeah, I think that, that would be pretty pretty challenging to do at the global level, right? But yeah. uh, you may have a no. They're yeah, just still in early stages. Yeah. I would say it's hard to analyze. That. Too early. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Um, I've got some more, but are there questions, live questions from the audience? Yes. Do we have a Jaffa? Do we have a microphone? 
We don't. Just stand up oh, and ask the comes. question. I'll repeat it. Uh, oh, here we have. Here we have the microphone. Thank you. Um, Jean-François Boitin with MEDEF. Uh, and I've just one quick remark and three questions. The remark is... Quick remark, You yes. mentioned 2% of global uh, U.S. service exports. Isn't that peanuts, essentially? Uh, and But my, th my questions are, there are costs of implementation for companies under the uh, new laws. Uh, did you count the jobs that they are going to create uh, so that all these people that are actually laid off by companies in the Silicon Valley can find jobs implementing the DSA and the DMA? Second question is, why should Europe wait for regulations coming from this country when there is a proof that no regulation whatsoever is coming from this country, be it at Congress level or through actions by the FTC. And third question is, two weeks ago Thierry Breton mentioned here that if you drive in Europe, you have to follow the traffic laws in Europe. Does anybody contest that affirmation by Thierry Breton among the panel members? Um. I can answer, I'm for, there are too many questions, Jean-Francois, I forgot, who wants to answer any of them? Okay. I, um, no, I, we didn't count the jobs that might be created by implementation. That's actually interesting, like how many lawyer jobs might be, uh, <laughs> might be created or so forth. Um, uh, no, th that was not exactly, there, we didn't even think it, that this might be necessarily a job loss. We calculated the equivalent to, a uh, job equivalent that might be. Yeah, uh, this was to analyze the. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, no, sorry. Go ahead. Go. This was to analyze the costs. I, I think uh, we would all agree that uh, there are always benefits as well as costs, and in, the inevitable question, as Gerard said, is is whether the benefits exceed the costs. Uh, in this case, I think we quantified the costs, uh, and uh, I don't. I'm not sure that anybody has quantified the benefits. Uh, it would probably be a good thing to try to do that, uh, and to put some numbers there so that we can compare. The second question on uh, why delay, I don't think we've suggested, I don't, and this paper certainly doesn't suggest uh, that the EU delay anything. I, I mean, that's come up. Uh, in fact, if you look at other uh, Scholz share work on exactly the subject, the previous nine papers, one of the comments we've made frequently has been the failure of Congress uh, to address these issues and how that has handicapped our development, uh, our ability to develop policy. I don't think there's anything, any debate about that, but we are not suggesting in this paper uh, that the, the EU stop and, and, and wait for the United States. We have suggested on several occasions the United States needs to move faster and catch up. Yeah, and right. I was just going to foot stomp on both that, that, to your second and third question. No one's saying that the European Union and the citizens of Europe and their political institutions don't have a right to move forward with regulation. We want them to do so in a thoughtful manner that, do, that is aware of potential, potential secondary consequences to global markets to scale those other things that I raised. Uh, and I think that we also got to be very much aware that a big part of this commission has been reducing dependencies in the digital uh, sphere on countries including the United States. Now, it's fundamental to trade that we have dependencies on one another. We look for specialization. It should not be a goal of the European Union to reduce dependencies. That's what uh, at least one uh, senior parliamentarian involved in the DMA said, and it's what senior commission officials have said repeatedly, reducing dependency, including on the United States. That is got to be addressed. We, can, we have to be lockstep together. We have to be dependent on one another. And if there's frictions in that system, we need to solve those. And that's where the Trade and Technology Council and other venues can come in to solve that. But no regulation should be an attempt to undermine what is perceived to be a dependency on the United States, because we also have dependencies on Europe, we need to figure out how we iron out any differences in regulation. And that actually relates to the, uh, an earlier question that uh, we've sort of addressed, which is, doesn't the thrust of this paper really, uh, more than anything else, uh, demonstrate the necessity of cooperation at earlier levels uh, for stakeholders globally? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. We all can obvious. have our own regulations, but they need to be interoperable. 
Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that I mean, there has been extensive discussions for three, four years on this. So the more involvement of stakeholders, we've had public consultations, been a democratic process. I mean, this, this, this is not cooked up in some kind of dark room in Brussels. This has been a thoroughly open process with lots of impact assessment, <coughs> lots of discussion. And so to, to, to suggest somehow that this kind of was not taken into account, also the costs were not taken into account, is, is again, is a, is, a, is a false statement. I mean, we're all for the dialogue. I mean, there's lots of dialogue. It would be maybe have been useful if the author of the study would have sought a dialogue with the European Commission before issuing a, a report that kind of is fundamentally flawed. Um, maybe also useful to point out, because one of the first things I always look at when I look at reports is who are the sponsors of the report which I don't think was, was mentioned here during the, the presentation here. I mean, these are the big tech companies that are kind of um, uh, sponsoring this report. Well, the big tech companies did not mention these issues in the negotiations. And then there's a report coming out kind of after the fact saying, look, this is the, 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 the costs are going to be disproportionate. So uh, I think we can do a better job. I mean, I think we, we, it's a, it, maybe it's a first step, but it's a step you can see I get quite upset about kind of having a discussion on the basis of like what might be or false assumptions. I mean, let's look at the benefits, also the jobs. This is not jobs for lawyers. I mean, we're going to open up markets. There's going to be a lot of innovation in these markets that will create new jobs. You talk about issues. I mean, content moderation is really important. I think we all want to keep our kids safe. We want to kind of make sure that the Internet is a safe place to go. These are not kind of jobs that kind of are, are like a waste on our economy. These are very important jobs because they serve an important public policy interest. So let's have more of these discussions, but then let's, it, let's have it on the basis of the facts and, and let's also look at the benefits and not just be obsessed with, with the cost. Any legislation has cost. I mean, the uh, kind of making sure that pharmaceuticals are, are safe, making sure that banks don't go under, making sure that cars are safe. Yeah, that's cost. You have to put cost into that. Do we want that? Do we think these are the right costs for industry to pay? Absolutely, because we don't want to to have like a, a world where a bank can collapse or where, where we, we take drugs and, and they make us sick or where kind of cars are, are unsafe and, and, and they get us into in, into accidents. So let's have a, a, a grown-up and honest discussion about these issues. And the EU is very happy to, to be in a constant dialogue. I, we're, at, we're at time, but I, I can't resist closing by saying if the EU wants to, uh, I, I think examining the, uh, the quantifying the benefits is a good idea. If the EU, EU wants to fund a study uh, that would quantify the benefits, uh, we'd be glad to ask Cotty to undertake it. Um, so, you know, what this study has done is provided numbers about costs, uh, and I concede there are benefits. I don't know what the numbers are there, and I don't think the EU has provided any. Uh, and it would be a notable, uh, a worthy effort to try to find some. I think that's a good idea, what and is the we should calculate them. Our kids what is the benefit of sustaining our democracies? What is the benefit of not being exposed to child sex abuse material? You want to quantify all of that? Can we think just as human beings that it's good to be protected? Anything else? No. Okay. Well, Gerard, you have the last word then, and you've just uh, used it. So <laughs> thank, you for, uh, thank you to the audience for joining us. Thank you, Gerard, for joining us remotely. I know it's early out there, although you've managed to use a, uh, use a, a screen that makes it look like it's uh, daylight and the weather is wonderful. <laughs> I, I, hope that, I hope your day turns out to be that, as nice as your screen looks. Uh, and thank you to uh, Rob and Meredith uh, and jo for joining us as well, and, and for Kati uh, as well for doing all the work behind this. Uh, this is, as I said, uh, not the last word from CSIS on this subject. Uh, Meredith has several more papers to go, and we look forward to continue to follow this because in the end this is going to play out. Uh, the DMA and the DSA are going to go into effect. Something will happen, uh, and we will be able to see at that point what the results are and whether uh, we have accurately predicted what the costs are going to be. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>